Hi, my lovely Sunwalkers. It's me, Jenna O'Malley, your soul writer. I'm actually picking up an old podcast series, kind of from the archives. This is going to be episode two of Listening to the Voices in Our Heads. The first episode, of course, was filmed with Yubaka of Emerald Company Gaming. Oh, goodness. Holidays 2020. So check the corner. Whatever corner is appropriate for you to check for the iCard to link back to that first episode so, you know, you can start the playlist off the correct way. And just wanted to give you a little bit of a heads up of what's going on with this episode. We are going to meet with my favorite editor, my saint editor, Miss Catherine Black of bestbookeditors.com. And we're going to be talking about a myriad of things about being an editor, about being a writer, about how lockdown has and has not affected writing, the entertainment world as a whole. We go above and beyond and talk about a little bit of everything in this podcast, so you're definitely going to want to sit tight, stay tuned, buckle up, and join us for the long haul. Welcome back, my lovely Sunwalkers. We've got my favorite editor in the world. Okay, my only editor I've ever had with us, Miss Catherine Black. Hello, my darling. I am absolutely fine, thank you. Hi. Hi, everybody. So, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do, what you've written, what you read, what you edit. Okay, so um, I'm... Catherine Black, I own bestbookeditors.com. Um, we're a sort of one-stop shop for everything you need to get your book published. So we edit, we do book covers, we do book trailers, we do um, typesetting, logos, you name it, we do it. And marketing. We offer a big marketing package with every, every commission we get. Um, from a writing point of view, I've been writing... Um, probably since about the turn of the century now so i'm an old old lady now, wait a minute uh, wait a minute let's clarify because some of us think the turn of the century was the 1899 to 1900 oh, oh at least at least <laughs> <laughs> she is one of the oldest souls i've ever known and you write what type of novels hun? i'm primarily psychological thrillers um i i love uh, killing somebody before i've had my breakfast <laughs> Um, I, I, I like the dark, I like psychology, I like looking at what makes people tick and how far they will go for that tick. Um, so I, I write pretty dark stuff, but I've also got um, a fantasy adventure series out called Lizard's Leap, and the second one in that series is Keepers of the Quantum. Ooh, um, I, I didn't got... realise it was a series, I'm sorry for interrupting, I didn't realise that was a series. <laughs> It is. It's a, a well. It, at the moment, it's a trilogy. Um, has the potential to go further. I have just re-edited, recovered, and re-released the first one, which is Lizard's Leap. I've got the second one on the metaphorical spike to do the same to when I get round to it because that was written probably, oh, probably about I haven't even a clue. Probably about fifteen years ago. Wow. Um, so I, I haven't even I haven't read it in fifteen years. So I have no idea how bad the writing is in that. I couldn't tell you. Um, I haven't opened it. I've got it, as I say, on the spike, waiting for an edit, and I'll get round to it one day, maybe eventually. <laughs> and I'll find so out. So busy. Really busy, really ridiculously busy. And from I wanted to clarify for your own publication means are you traditional or self-published slash indie no i am i'm i'm strictly indie i've been traditional um and didn't like it and about 15 years ago i came away from my managing company um i had a fantastic manager absolutely brilliant guy and i was with him for many years um but unfortunately when my son my youngest son was only 10 he wanted me to move to london he felt that um for me to progress uh, long story short i had an amazing opportunity 
the actor and movie director Armand Asante was interested in taking the Lizard's Leap series to make a blockbuster movie from. It came down to, in the end, it came down to um, my book and one other. In the end, he went with the other, which was Judge Dredd. Yeah, (laughs) Sylvester, Judge Dredd, that could have been my Lizard's Leap. However, what my management team wanted me to do was they wanted me to move to London, start at the Capitol, do book talks in every single um, primary school and secondary school that we could so that the children of the world were already familiar with the Lizard's Leap concept so that when the movie came out, happy days, they all wanted to see it. I couldn't do that because my personal circumstances just weren't in a position to move from one end of the country to the other with my with my young son. Um, leaving my older son, who's 10 years older, mm-hmm. uh, it just wasn't viable at this time. I understand so, and appreciate that sentiment very yeah. much so. I ran out my contract and we, we decided, still very good friends, if ever I go to London, I go down to the office and look them up and have a coffee and Aww. we parted very amicably. Um, but since then, um, I decided let's give this indie lark a go. Um, so I've I've published indie and the hunger's gone, to be honest, Jenna. You know, 20 years ago, I was so hungry. I did every event going. If somebody had a table, I had my books on the table doing a sign. I opened libraries. I did coffee mornings. I did car boot sales. You name it, I did it. And I did a lot of school work. Um, Now, I'm strictly hobby. I know, having worked with many, many authors, I know I'm not very good. Um, I disagree. Yeah. My books are okay. They, they, they do okay. But you I'm, addicted I'm... me to a genre I didn't like, honey. Come on. <laughs> well, that's something. <laughs> but, you know, as I say, I'm not hungry for it anymore. I do it because I enjoy it when I get the time, which is virtually nil. Um so, yeah, that side of, of my life is strictly hobby now, whereas at one time it was career, try and make a go of it. I had so many opportunities that didn't quite get me there. And now I work for other people and help them with their books. Well, we love you. At least I do. Oh, my goodness. I call you Saint Editor for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just so you all know, You edit both sides of the divide, right? You have some of your author clientele's indie, me included. Yes. But you have others that are traditional, right? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, And it's that great debate for Mm -hmm. a new writer. What do I do? Which line do I take? Now, I think what the writer needs to do is read some best bestsellers, some of the mainstream yes. stream stuff. Step away from their work and look at it with a really critical eye. Am I that good? If you think as a writer you're up there, then yes, go mainstream. Mm-hmm. But be very aware that it's going to take you two years to even think about having a book in print. And I heard in some um, genres it's as high as five years. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, um, you're looking at a minimum of two years. Wow. It's a very long, slow process. You've got to have such a thick skin. I mean, I was lucky with my first um, book, I was actually scouted um, very, very early days of the internet. I mean, computers had just been invented. And I was posting on a writing site and somebody actually came to me. I'd, I'd never even considered being a writer. Um, Lizard Sleep was my first ever book. Wow. And it, it was just a silly story for my son and my, my nieces. Um, somebody saw a chapter and asked me if I'd write for them. Um, and that's how it came to be. But for people these days, one, the market is so saturated. 
Especially as we'll talk later with a pandemic. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> but, you know, Indy or Trad, um, I think if you go in Trad, one, you've got to have a very, very thick skin. Yes. You're going to get rejected. You know, people, new writers, we've, we've all been there. You know, everybody thinks their book is the next Bible. You know, it's the <laughs> best thing ever written. We all think that. Of course we do. We've got an ego. We're writers. Right. Right. And, yeah, we all think this is the best thing ever. The whole world is going to love this. And as a new writer... Go and try, you are going to get rejected. Hard. There is no doubt about it. If you send your first query letter off to your first agent and they say, absolutely brilliant, I'm taking it, and you get your first publishing deal from that first letter, it's almost a miracle. And believe me, I would like to meet that writer. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't happen. So I think for most... Now... Of course, once you've gone indie, it's very hard to go trad. Um, yes. People are not going to touch you after you've gone indie. Um, to break free of that, it's quite a process. You're going to have to have a new pseudonym. You're going to have to start from scratch. Yep. Um, you're going to have to depublish all your books. Um I think if you think you're good enough, every writer should probably try trad first. Um, now, I know you haven't done that, Jenna, and in a way, I think that's a shame because you are up there. Um, Honey, no. Course, Thank you, but no. What has your client growth as an editor been like in the last six months? Right. So six months were growing, growing, growing. Um the work is coming in. I have I, what I've done is I've gone far, far too big, too fast. I started the company in November 2020, and I started. I put an advert out. Um, I'd, I'd come away from my previous employer. I worked for uh, KWES for 20 years, wow. and um, still do. I actually did a book for KWES two weeks ago, so I'm still taking commissions for them. Okay. Um, but with um, personal circumstances, I, I full-time carer for my um, father-in-law with dementia. Um, because of personal circumstances, I couldn't commit to a regular job. So I moved away and opened my own company with my previous employers back in and help and support and um i put an advert out having zero clients and in the first week i got three one of which was you jenna yes. and which is why you're one of my favorites because you're one of my first and Aww. you know you're my babies you three are my babies um so we started with three clients and I gave a two-week deadline and I was happily pushing books out in a week and no problem, fling them out, work 80 hours a week. The oh. books were great. I had all the time in the world and everything was wonderful. And then I got a few more clients in just editing, solely for editing. And um, my clients kept asking me questions where do I get it typeset? Where do I get a cover from? Can you help me with this? Can you help me with this? I would say, no, sorry, no, I'm an editor. That's all I do. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's all I know how to do. Um, and still the questions kept coming. Well, you know, what do I do now? So I thought, right, how can I help? I'm, I'm hopeless. I've got no skills whatsoever when it comes to design or typesetting or anything like that. I, I have my guru who does everything for me. Um, unfortunately, he wouldn't come and work with me because he's got a fabulous job that earns a lot of money doing it. So I hit the internet and I looked to hire a book cover designer and a typesetter. And from there, things have grown. And now we offer about 20 services. Yeah. 
and the clients have grown and the clients keep coming however now i've got i think i've got 15 freelancers who all want work yes I, i've gone silly jenna i've gone absolutely stupid um i've taken a lot of illustrators on um i've taken my video designer on um logo designers and learning some skills on the side i've heard and seen congratulations yes i'm, I'm trying I'm, I'm trying to learn a bit myself so that i don't have to rely on other people for everything i understand um, that very much yeah. <laughs> the, ladies and gentlemen this this is all DIY as, as well, so what she's saying rings true. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, everything, everything that can be done, you can learn yourself. Exactly. Now, I'm a big believer in hire a professional. Mm. Edit it. When you put a book out, one, the very first thing that somebody is going to see is your cover. Is yes. it good? You know, there's three styles of cover. There's the absolute amateur who will get some clip art, put a single clip art picture, block on the cover, a name and a title, and they're awful. A step up from that is somebody who's had a little bit of design experience and they've learned how to shade and fade and they've learned a little bit about leading and kerning and everything else. And it's a little bit more professional. Calling but myself can... out on that one. <laughs> you hire somebody to do your artwork my... and it's fabulous. <laughs> uh, my second book cover makes my first book cover look jealous for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, and then there's the professional. And the professional knows all the tricks. They match front to spine to back, um, even if they are different, completely different graphics. And you can, for instance, a, a little trick that I had no idea about, every new author will put their book title on the back. If you look at mainstream books, they don't have the book title on the back. It goes straight into the blurb. Tiny little things like that that people don't know, don't understand. Um, right. <laughs> you know, there's so much. There's so much in creating these things. And professionals have been to university for three years. Right. They own a business. You know, they know what they're doing. And it purely comes down to, again, it's a similar question to should I go indie or should I go trad? Um, with your book cover, with your editing, with do I do it myself or do I hire a, a, a professional? What do you want? Do you want your book out there, which is fabulous? You've got a paperback in your hand. You can feel it. You can touch it. You can read it. You can look at it. Do you want to sell your book to 100 friends and family and maybe get a few sales here and there just to give you a boost from Amazon? Are you happy with that? Many people are. Um, or do you want to be serious about it? Right. Now, if you want to be serious, then you've got to really put some money into it. Or you need to hire them. What your yeah, budget allows you to do. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we have... Most people writing books have another job Correct. or, you know, they're doing it on an evening and a weekend. Funds aren't unlimited and, you know, I understand that. However, if you want to do well, it's the whole speculate to accumulate thing. Yep. If you want to sell books at a professional serious level, then you have to have the professional serious tools of the job to do that. And that's... Um, Sorry to interrupt. That's something actually I was talking to someone I'm kind of mentoring right now about. Um, reminds me of one of my favorite authors, J.R. Ward. She's a mainstream paranormal romance author, and she kind of says what you're saying. This is a business. You have to decide how you want to play the business's game. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. You need to know what you want. And you need to decide that fairly early on. Yes, very much from so. The whole, yeah, from the whole trad indie, 
um, do it yourself or go professional. I would always say if you've got the money, go professional because they know what they're doing. Yep. Um, next question, Jenna. Well, actually, to kind of piggyback off of that, um, mm -hmm. when this goes back to a previous conversation we had when you edited book one, I was I couldn't find somebody who would edit book one. They thought it was horrible, and you were like, "Well, it, the draft is horrible, but." And I was surprised because your pricing was more what I was expecting in the market, and the people turned me down. We're asking thousands of dollars. Yeah. And I'm like, "What's the difference here?" And I think part of it might also be on their end. You as an editor, if you're into editing any kind of medium, need to know your skills and what they're worth and develop your clientele accordingly, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's three different levels of editing, and I class myself somewhere in the middle. You've got your bedroom editor who has the job through the week, um, possibly in publishing, publish, possibly not. And they do it as a hobby, hobby, um, you know, charging $50 for an edit, $100, something like that. I try to keep my prices in line with indie authors because most of my clients are indie. And I realise that it's very easy to price yourself out of the market, which yes. is in a way what I've done. Um, I started off... Um, and I was I was editing books for about two hundred and fifty pounds. Now, when you think that I think my my longest book was a hundred and twenty three hours. That's probably um, my book. <laughs> it wasn't actually. It wasn't. Really? Yours alone. Because you told me it was. I remember it was up there, and I'm like, I'm sorry if it was. And thank you for yeah, your patience. <laughs> yours was cer yeah, certainly over a hundred hours. But I don't think it, it, it I think yours is it, it's up there with several others. Um, so, you know, when you're looking at trying to run a business, I'm tr it's a fine balance between keeping your prices down yes. so that people can afford it and pricing yourself out of the market. Supply now, and demand. Exactly. And top professional uh, editors are, are charging anything up to um, 10 pence per word. That is, yeah, that's putting your manuscript an 80,000 doc word. You know, you, you are t you're talking into the thousands. Yeah. Um, my pricing structure at the moment, I don't know if I should be putting that out there. Go but I for like it. To, Go for I, it. You know, I'm transparent. Um, I... Um, so I had to hike my prices and then I had to hike my prices again. And now my set rate that I don't see changing is I charge £250 for up to 30,000 words and then £5 per thousand words after that. That's actually not bad. It's not, it's not, but it's more than a lot of people can afford. Um, you know, you're looking at, I've just got my calculator out here. Um, oh, clear, 45 times 5 equals 25. For a 70,000 word document, you're looking at 475 pounds. That's not bad. Even with it, from where I'm standing, you're in the UK, I'm in the US, with a conversion rate, even that's not bad. You know, it's more than most people, not, not most, it's more than some people can afford. And I have found the work was coming in hand over fist from last November up to my second price hike in June, beginning of June, mm -hmm. I had work backed up. I took that second hike um, by taking the base rate from 40,000 words down to 30,000 words right. and from £4 a thousand up to £5 a thousand. It wasn't an illogical jump. It really wasn't. During the quality of work you 
do that is behind the scenes. Yeah, Honey, absolutely. it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I mean but it. Just that that two hikes has taken me from being swamped with work to the point that I could hire, well, two more editors. Right to the work slowing right down because I've gone from that 350. There seems to be a, um, a, a set in indie authors' minds that they are willing to pay up to £350 to have their book done, be that a 40,000-word book or a 100,000-word book. There seems to be this magic figure of 350. Once I went over that... Um, I kind of priced myself out of the market. So now I'm having to fight for work. Um, you know, when somebody says, I need an editor on the writing groups, mm -hmm. I will go on to put on my little, my little advert, please come to us. There will be 90 people in front of me and there'll be another 90 people after me. Correct. It's a little bit flooded. Yes, and this is for both editing and cover work and illustrations. And you've got people offering to do an edit for $50. How can I compete with that? You know, it, it's just people want two things. They want cheap and they want good. Now, and that two don't necessarily go together. Does not equal. If you know your math yeah. symbols, people, draw lines for that equal sign. No. Uh uh, I will admit, I I say this as a teacher who has seen kids edit each other's work. Y'all don't edit equally for the price you charge, and I would honestly, as a professional, one who did freelance editing to pay the bills in college for, a while, I'd I know that you got to put your money where your mouth. Is. Yeah. Absolutely. And absolutely. For me, kind of backtracking in our conversation a little bit, um, that you know, you were kind of shocked I didn't go traditional. Uh, I didn't want to stand the two to five year rejection letters <laughs> for one, yeah. um, but also for two, it went into I had a control over who my editor. I didn't get to pick from a small pile of small hat of names or anything like that i got to pick the editor right for me and i'm just going to shamelessly plug her work here guys she's the reason why my novels are rocking right now not me my right i can write somebody i can write my own work i cannot edit my own work i'm one of those writers that i can edit for someone else i can teach someone else to kind of do some editing but I am not good at editing my work. That's something that I need to read my process. This lady has patience of a saint and is worth every pence and penny you give her. So if you do not at least reach out as a writer to get consultation or something from her, you're really, really, really wasting an offer to one who knows what they're doing. And if you want be treated like a professional and not be sneered at as an indie author for being an indie author she's worth having a conversation with at minimum hiring at best so you've got my, my vote all the time and don't discredit yourself on seriously don't thank you very much for that that is massively appreciated thank um, you perfect and, and especially since you said you were inundated there with a lot of Series. This kind of helps us segue back into our questions. How have lockdowns affected your writing career or lifting of, I guess, in some ways too, as an editor? Yeah. So for me, it, 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 lockdown hasn't affected me. What has affected me is having my father-in-law here. Um, lockdown has almost been a tiny little insignificance to me. Um, because he is the bigger picture. Um, it's 24 hours a day. It's um, kind of in the background of what's... It's always there. Um, from the business point of view, it's difficult to know 
how it would have gone if we hadn't been in lockdown because I started the business in lockdown because I work anywhere else. Um, because I'm a carer for my father-in-law, I was actually working for the government at the beginning of lockdown. Really? Uh, yes, as well as doing editing work, I, I had a full-time sure. nine-to-five job um, working for the government, um, doing government governmental interviews. Um, and that fit in well with Grandad because I, I got to be allowed to go home and do it from home and this was uh, sort of before full lockdown started all at the same time we all got covid granddad got it gave it to us we all yeah. had it and my job became unattainable because um i i was online constantly and he'd come shuffling in with his state of undress and it just didn't work so I had to give up my job and I had no choice really I couldn't do the editing for KWES because that was rigid as well my my job as an interviewer was rigid um so I I needed to find something that I could do that fit in with with granddad um and basically this was it and I have bitten off a lot more than I can chew. I will admit that freely. You're so now, definitely a strong woman like that, though. I, I, people will say, "How do I do this?" And I'll say, "Give me ten minutes, and I'll come <laughs> back with an answer." And then I think, "Who can I hire to do this?" So I've taken on all these people, and all these people keep saying, "Have you got some work for me? Have you got some?" Yes, yes. Hang on, I'll just get you some. And I fling an advert out please somebody you know get some type set in so i'll market the type setting and then while i'm market, marketing the type setting the book trailers stop so then i have to oh, leave the type setting to market the book trailers because my book trailer designer will come to me have you got anything for me yet yeah, give me 10 minutes right <laughs> let's get some book trailers in and, and it's this constant 50 balls in the air, juggle, juggle them all at the same time and wait and see which one comes crashing around my ears first, <laughs> which they do regularly. Um, so for me, it, it's difficult to know how the business would have gone had it not been for lockdown and what Correct. difference that has made. But taking that slightly a way to how has lockdown affected writers mm -hmm. i think two things have affected the in, the industry the first one was the internet yes when i was writing with a piece of chalk on a blackboard um there was no internet or it was in the very early days of the internet <laughs> and oh my God. It, there was a way of doing things. You sent, you wrote letters by hand, True. and you sent your letter out with usually um, either your first three chapters or a, a first chapter, middle chapter, and last chapter, right. and a synopsis. That is what you did, and you waited six weeks for them to get back to you, and then they wrote to you, and then you wrote to them, and things were forged. Then we had the internet. And suddenly, there was this fantastic medium for publishing. Everything could be online, done online. And then came the monster of hybrid or um, vanity publishing, yeah. which I'm not a fan of. I'll Me be neither. honest. Um, I think then it morphed again because people didn't trust vanity publishing, so it morphed again to this hybrid publishing, which. I wouldn't use, it's not for me, but for other authors, for certain authors, it's fabulous because it takes all the stress out of it. They send to their um, hybrid publisher, the hybrid publisher does all the work and I believe, you know, there's various different deals. Right. You either get a thousand orders up front or you split the profits or however it works Correct. um it wouldn't be for me but i th definitely think it has its place in the market and in the industry if it uh, fits your needs your situation go for it basically 
Exactly. And then we had lockdown. And suddenly, the whole country was out of work. The whole world was out of work. The whole world, sorry, <laughs> the whole world was out of work. Nas uh, internationally, pandemically, we yeah. were all out of work. And everybody wrote a book. Everybody. Felt like it. Um, yeah, the market is just flooded. There are so many authors out there now. Um, it has become such a huge industry. And that has led to two things. One, it has brought out some exceptional writers. And two, it has brought out some bloody awful writers. Take your and pick. Which side of the scale happens, they both absolutely. are there. Yes, and at the moment, there are no, um, there's no guidelines, there's no restrictions. Mm -hmm. I think we need to come to a point in publishing. Uh, Amazon, if you're listening, please. Yes, Amazon, where, listen up. Where there is a certain standard. You know, I have bought books um, on my Kindle that are virtually illegible. Um, they are unreadable. They yes. are that bad. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking really bad. No offense um, to the complete, formula and the people who use it well. I think absolutely. we can definitely say these are the people who are throwing books together in a weekend. Yes. And are that not paying other people or even having other people edit for them. Yeah. I'd like to take it, a moment and tell some of my former students, because that's basically what y'all are. You can't turn in an assignment the day before it's due and expect an A. I was just going to say, it's that gradient. There are some people publishing books that really should not be publishing books. Or definitely um, need to pay an editor first. Yes, absolutely. I mean, everybody has that right. Everybody has got a story in them. Correct. Everybody should be able to publish a book. Whether they should be doing it on their own without help is quite another matter um and what lockdown has done is it has brought out all these writers some of them at the low scale of the gradient that are virtually illegible most of us in the middle who need a bit of help need a good edit a book can always be tightened it can always be tightened it can always be made better and then there's the excellence, and it has brought out some excellent writers. Um, and it is a saturated market, it is flooded, and this is why we all struggle with our book sales, because there's just so much choice out there. And something I'll be writing a blog on my website here in the future is we're also not just competing against TV and regular old Nintendo and You've got 24-hour access to things like Twitch, YouTube, Disney+, Plus, Final Fantasy XIV, and other video games that connect people across the world. I mean, it's not... The entertainment industry, I think, is saturated, and we are one of the more saturated spokes on that wheel right now. So, yeah. Therefore, since it seems like you've... Witness the gambit, we shall say, as a writer, editor, and reader. What is your number one pet peeve as an editor, then? Oh, number... Am I only allowed one? Considering I know okay. most of them, yes. Yes, <laughs> yes I've, got I've got one. Stage management. I knew I it. I hate it. I knew I it. I hate it. I knew it. Um, <laughs> For those that don't know, because it, it's what um, it, it's what I call it. Um, it's something I made up myself. I have my my little my little phrases that I throw at my authors all the time. Acting, um, movie, TV, and theater nerds get this reference. <laughs> so stage management is if you are having a line of dialogue between two people now when you have more than two people in a conversation it does become more difficult and that's a slightly very slightly different subject you need tricks to get around it but let's just talk about two people in a dialogue conversation so stage management 
is like having that annoying little child. You meet somebody in the street and you stop to have a chat with them and they've got this five-year-old child with them that every time you open your mouth to speak or the other person opens their mouth to speak, this child is tugging on their skirt and saying, Mum, 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 I want to wait. Mum, Mum. And that is stage management. Let a conversation flow. Let the speakers speak. Don't have, um, he cocked his eyebrow, he nodded his head, he looked to the left, he looked to the right, he looked up, he looked down, he looked down the street, he looked at the bus, his eyes went cross-eyed and he looked at his feet and then he looked at the sky. You know, it's rubbish. It's Mind rubbish. You. I'm not the only one laughing. Ian's losing his mind <laughs> laughing at me right now. Ian's with us and Frey and all the gang. <laughs> you act like they shut up. Ah, they're all you here act with... like they shut up. <laughs> I don't get any sleep. Are you okay? <laughs> um, but Perfect. no. Yes, I, I'm i also most laughing because this is the number one thing in every single edit I've ever gotten from Jenna. Shut up. Let so and so and so and so do the co the talking. We get that they're angry or that they're schmoozing each other or whatever's going on. Just let them talk. <laughs> let them speak. Yes, exactly. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you are a newish writer to the industry and you're struggling, take it from someone who's been an English teacher for ten years. You have room to improve. Anyway, <laughs> um, in all realistic reality though pet peeves how many of them would you say in general do this if you were to give a number oh hundreds hundreds <laughs> um let's cut it down to top three stage management adverbs mm -hmm. yeah. anything with an ly word so an adverb is something beautifully prettily, significantly, dedicatedly, anything that ends in L-Y. My get advice it, is, get rid of it. yeah, read that sentence aloud. Isolate the sentence, any sentence that's got an L-Y in it, read it aloud. Take that word out, does it still make sense? 95, possibly even 99 times out of 100, that sentence will make complete sense without that word in it. And often still pack the same oomph you wanted it to in the first place. Yes. That if was the hardest sense, thing for me to learn. <laughs> get rid. Get rid of what doesn't need to be there. So, number one, stage management. Number two, adverbs. Number three, is more a do rather than a don't. Um, make every single word of every single sentence add something to your book. So anything that doesn't need to be there, get rid. It's the hardest thing for an author to do. Get rid of the waffle. Yes, you need description, yes. but make your description count. Make it make it worthwhile description rather than just tumbleweed white noise waffle Correct. you know add something um oh example um it was such a beautifully hot sunny day um you know the town sits in a valley between two mountains and the sun came down over the rooftops. You're saying something to give a description. That was a terrible example, but it's it giving an example. First draft. You know, it, it's, it's saying something. Rather than just the sun was shining, it was nice and hot, it's adding to the story. So stage management, get rid of your adverbs, Make every single word in that book count. If it doesn't count, if it doesn't say anything worthwhile, get rid of it. You're not Charles Dickens. You're not getting paid by the word anymore. 
because it's only killing your printing costs, really. <laughs> yeah. So, if you could edit for any author, who would you pick and why? Right, I've got two. If I could edit for my favourite author, I would love to edit for Dean Koontz because I think the man... I, I'd uh -huh. have his babies. Uh -huh. I would have his man's babies if I could. Uh -huh. So that is who I would like to edit for. Now, the one author that I would really like to take on, and this is going to sound ridiculously egotistical, but I would love to edit for Stephen King because he has got so much empty waffle in his books yes. he went from writing a 300 page book that was tight i mean carry the shining misery um fan oh cujo did he write Cujo? yes he did yeah. did he i think he did yes cujo um you know his early novels uh, christine uh, they were so tight they were so good and then he became a monster of his own creation. Yes. He he got the power to be able to dictate what he wanted. And suddenly he was taking three pages to describe a leaf. You know, get on with the damn story, man. I love him. I love his work. Um, it's brilliant. He has, oh, fantastic. But he has become an ingredient of the churn factory. Yes. Yes. Yeah. A, a book a year is the standard, at right. least, a minimum of a book a year. And it is the churn factory. And it, Koontz as well. I mean, I love Dean Koontz, The World and Back, but even his books aren't as good as his, you know, original. When he was Dean, Dean R. Koontz, was it? I think Dean so. R. Yeah, Dean R. were his early ones. Um so, yeah, if I could edit for anybody, I'd, I'd, I'm going to the top. I'll edit for Stephen King. If you're out there, Mr. King, I'm here. I'm available. I will drop everybody like a hot brick to take you on. Come and get me. Well, the next time I go visit my in-laws in uh, the Bangor main area, maybe I'll try and stop by. <laughs> if, you, yeah, if you could just knock on, knock on his door, please. I've, you know, say hi to the dog and just say, Susie's waiting for you. I will admit I've done the creepy tourist thing of went and got a picture outside his house. And we went to my father-in-law. So. Whoa! <laughs> it's beautiful. Oh, wow. Yes, the lights are on 24-7. Wow. <laughs> so, if you're ever in Bangor, Maine, enjoy. And he owns the radio station there, too. And they play good music. We love Ooh. going Wow. Oh, that's fascinating. So, we're starting to wind down to the end of our podcast here. Do you have anything, before I go into the last couple of questions, um, do you have any projects right now that you're really excited about working on or that you're looking at working on in the future? You know what I'm going to say. You better not. <laughs> I've just started learning how to do book trailers myself. You better. The, the past the past weekend I've been neglecting all the duties. <laughs> Tegan, excuse me one second. Tegan's having a say. Tegan. Hello, Tegan. Uh, we love the puppers around yeah. here, so he definitely can talk. Oh yes. Um so yes, I've been playing with um video editing and learning that and um i think that could become a new hobby for me it's for stress books, relieving oh, it's it's fantastic i love it I've, I've done a weekend and produced three videos um that aren't, none of them are finished yet then me um, the third one <laughs> oh it's not ready yet oh. i'm learning different tricks and how to do this and how to do that and how to include sound effects and how to overlay oh, them and wonderful. it's I'm enjoying it. But, yes, from a, from a book point of view, if anybody would be interested in buying my books, it's Catherine Black. Um, my big four are A Question of Sanity, Leverage, Pedigree Crush with a Twisted Gene, which is probably going to undergo a new cover and a name change, and Nowhere Boulevard. Mm. Then I've got Lizard's Leap, which came out last week, the most recent version. Um, 
please buy that. It's suitable for the whole family. Definitely should, guys and girls. <laughs> and in the next however long, I've got a five-set book ready to go and in final stages of editing. I want to get that out. That's the Murmuration series. And I have my next psychological thriller that is two-thirds written and I hope to finish sometime. It hasn't really got a title. It's got a working title that's been changed umpteen times and will change again umpteen times before it's out. So there's no point in telling you the title. Um, and goodness knows when it'll be done because I'm just so busy with, with everything else. But yes, if anybody would like to buy my books, I would be more than happy for you to do so. Thank you. She is amazing. So if you want to read some good books, check out her books. If you want an editor who actually practices writing too, check her out as well. Um, do you have any reading recommendations by other authors you'd like to mention? Um, if I can mention some of my clients, please. This is uh, your forum to do so, honey. Go for it. Fantastic. So, first and foremost, I would like to recommend a young lady called Jenna O'Malley. <laughs> she has written two amazing books. I don't know if you've ever heard of a Jenna, but she's yeah. very, very good. I think we've um, met a couple times. <laughs> you know this person, and I'm not saying that to be a sycophant. I am saying that because her writing is genuinely good. Her stories are fabulous. Her characterization is very good. And her battle scenes are just out of this world. The humor is great. I mean, an all round good read. Um, so, yes, plug there for Jenna. Um, again, I would like to plug Peter J. Merrigan. Yes. Peter writes very sensitively. He's a very sensitive author. His first book, The Camel Trail, has reduced grown men to tears. Um, it's very good. His second two books are um, Ryder and Lynch, and they're detective um, murder right. type. And then his last two books, which is a series of either four or five, are the Stone series. And oh, they, they are so good. The set in uh, the Iron Age. Now, don't let that put you off. It, it does sound very niche. Um, they are historical books written in very rich language, set in the Iron Age where the world was governed, governed by the gods. Now, because it's niche, please don't be put off with that. His characterization is yesterday. Um, his characters are real, they live. Um, Jenna's books are set in the 1600s. Yep. And her characters are just as real, they oh. live. You know, a lot of people will think, oh, historical period novels, do I want to go that far back in time? Just, it did no. A good historical novel can take place in any era, and that's exactly. where Peter's books really sold me. I didn't, I forgot that I was in the Iron Age. Yes. I completely forgot when I read that series and started. Yes. I'm just like, okay, um, Buckle up, girlfriend. You got something to learn. <laughs> he, he's very good. He is very Amazing. good. And then for mainstream, as I've already said, I love Dean Koontz. I love Stephen King. Um, I like anything psychological. Anything that gets into somebody's head and plays around with it and twists it. Um, oh, the time traveler's wife. Oh. I, I, don't, I don't do mush and I don't do the. You suffer through my books? <laughs> exactly. And they're fabulous. You know, this is what you said. When you read mine, um, you came out of your genre. When I read yours or Peter's or The Time Traveler's Wife, I came out of my genre. And it shows that if a book is well written, you can Grand enjoy science. it. You, it's the writing. It's the writing and the engagement. And it's all about relationship, 
engagement and style. And any book in any genre, in any time period, can float your boat if you give it a go. This is true. Um, I, I join various groups where I commit to buying so many books over a given period. Yep, same here. And yeah, and what that has done is it has brought me completely out. I mean, I was so rigid in my reading. I know what I like. I like a psychological thriller or a horror, but mainly psychological thrillers. And I was set in that groove, and that is what floated my boat. That's what I enjoyed. Um, now I'm reading the most random books yes. and enjoying so many different genres, um, which, of course, I do with the editing as well. I never know what's coming through the door, and um, I can go from vampires one day to um, a memoir the next, well, week, a memoir the next <laughs> week to um, a war story. I can be anywhere doing anything. Um, and I think anybody that likes a book, anybody that enjoys reading, broaden your horizons, come out of your comfort zone and try yes. something new. And that's kind of what I say with my Fiction in Five series. There's that one book I will always pick that is my non-complacent choice to push that envelope. And if you want to get a review on any of her books, I've already done Leverage, I think. And I think the next one I'm doing for the fall is a question of sanity for my Fiction in mm -hmm. Five. So if you guys want a little bit of an insight that is non-spoilery, check another video. Helpless plug. But are there any... Have you done any poetry editing? I'm curious. Or screenplay? Yes, I have. Yes, I... Now, to be an editor, you don't have to like what you're doing. I That's don't fair. like poetry. I okay. don't enjoy poetry as a rule um, because when I'm reading, I'm a lazy devil and I want to be entertained. I, I don't understand. Want have, yeah, I don't want to have to read a sentence and think, what the hell does that mean? And dissect it and think about it. And that's what poetry makes you do. Yes. It makes you think. And I don't want to think. I just want to read and enjoy. Um, so poetry isn't my thing. However, yes, I have an, um, edited several poetry books. I believe I've made them better. I'd like, I'd like to think that I've um, helped the author to make them better. And I do double myself. Um, I don't like poetry. And poetry for me is very much my lazy out. When I'm in writing mode... I like to be quite driven and I will set myself a word count target and on those days when I get up and I think oh well, I don't want to do it I can't be bothered I know I'll write a poem no oh. it's my get out of jail free card you had to write so, something that day. yes so every so often I have a dabble and I write a little bit of poetry um just because something inspires me I've done a bit of songwriting as well oh. um, my hubby's a musician and um, you know he he plays the guitar so we do a bit of songwriting they sound um, amazing together too oh so amazing oh thank you oh, no, he's, 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 he's a singer I'm not I, I just shoot shoot in the background really oh come on I know better than that <laughs> you're welcome so do you have any other thing you'd like to plug or any questions for me how's book three going <laughs> how are we doing Ray and we are breaking good um I can't give you no please don't um, um, nope nope Nope, there's one that, um, I have a feeling I'm not getting an email when you edit this part. I have a feeling I'm getting a Facebook message or like a video message of you saying, look, I'm not allowed to throw my computer. <laughs> You're not going to be happy with me. To that. <laughs> You're not going to be happy with me. Oh, I'm not dear. happy that you 
thought chapter 18 made me ball my eyes out when I read it. You know chapter 18 with the file hound. Yes, yes. That ripped my insides apart to run away. Mm -hmm. This part's going to... I'm going to need to just write it, get it out of my system, and leave it alone. And time to plug it in, plug it in, and just start the next chapter as if nothing happened. Because mm -hmm. book three, every book so far for me has been, I'm also learning more about myself as a person, kind of exploratory writing. And yeah, living in Frey's head is way better than living in Bjorn's head. I will say that. But it's because Frey and I understand each other a little bit better. So it's been great. <laughs> Fantastic. And are you completely finished with book two now? Done, finished, boxed off, ready to go. I need to get it typeset and uh, and sent off to be published Other and whatnot this week. That's what you and I are talking about later today. <laughs> Other than that, we're all good to go with book two. Beta readers are loving it. Um, somebody, What's that? Uh, one beta reader said, uh, you should be talking with Mary Shelley if she were alive. <laughs> and I'm lovely. like, oh, that's like one of my favorite authors. Oh. That's Thank you. So that is nice. It's been great, though. This process, I think that I probably would not have done a second book had I not found an editor who, one, encourages me to do the right thing, and two, is not a yes woman. You tell me when I'm right, but hey, girl, hey, here, will definitely tell me when I'm wrong. <laughs> so. I mean... What I would like to say is when you came to me, you were in the depths of the lowest, and I don't know if I want to put this out. I did, oh, ice cream. Anybody want an ice cream? The oh. ice cream man's here. Oh, no. Um, just, just park the truck outside my house. Apparently Bjorn would like to eat all of it. Oh, six <laughs> cheesesteak pizzas, dude. Anyway. Greedy pig. Um, so, <laughs> yes. Um, when you came to me, you know, you said, I've had so much negative feedback on this. I didn't get that. From the first page, I thought, okay, this girl can waffle. This girl has got waffling to the hilt. Let's get rid of the waffle. And when you strip it back, it was so damned good. And I thought, why aren't people reading that? Is it so camouflaged with the waffle I think so. <laughs> that the people that, yeah, but, oh, I've got a mouth on me, Jenna, I'm going to say it. No. Were these people so thick that they just couldn't see the writing through the waffle? Oh. Just, to me, all it needed was cut in. It was that simple. And I say the same with your second book. All it needed was cut in. And you it's... emphasize, honey, pick up the big girl. Actually, I believe the reference was grab Rochelle's rapier and go after the book. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you probably want to edit this, but a phrase that was taught to me when I was in sales was lift up your skirts, grab your balls and get on with it. <laughs> and, you know, all, all they needed was cutting. And for somebody not to see that, I mean, these people were supposedly editors. Supposedly. I just don't get it, Jenna. Um, they were colourful, they were rich, the characterisation was all there, the, the relationships were all there, the building blocks were all there. And it, it was just surrounded with a cushion of waffle that needed to come away. Once that was away, they were fabulous. And I knew, um, and I admitted multiple times, and even earlier here, I'm one of those editors who cannot, or I'm sorry, one of those writers who can't edit their own. Yeah. I just can't by myself. And that's something, as an editor, that we've always got to be aware of. You know, I've built a relationship with you. And I know that I can be a little bit harder with you now and say, oh, come on, Jenna, come on. Yep, yep. How many times have we been through this? Yep. With a new author, 
you don't know that person they don't know you you haven't Correct. built that before and as an editor you've got to be so careful not to kill somebody's spirit you know one wrong word um and you could stop somebody who could be the next jk writing forever you know somebody could be pulled so down by a negative comment i even see that as a teacher i would get a kid who is a phenomenal writer never write anything for me because one teacher yeah that's one kill thing the spirit. yep i hear it i understand what you're saying so don't give up and on yourselves <laughs> Exactly. It, it, it's that double-edged sword. As an editor, we've got a job to do. Our job is, it doesn't matter whether you like the person, whether you don't like the person, whether you like the writing or you don't like the writing. Your job is to make their book the best book that it can be, in your opinion. And I always say in my overview, every single... I'm not university trained. Correct. I've had no training. Um, I have got 40 years of experience without training. Um, and I always say every comment I make, the good, the bad, the indifferent, it is only my opinion. Correct. The final verdict comes down to you. You take it, you leave it, you throw it up in the air, you rearrange it to make it fit you. You do what you want to do because it's your book. Um, and as an editor, we've got to be so careful to hit that balance of not pandering to somebody. You know, I, I have um, clients with certain learning difficulties. True. I have, yes, I've got clients with certain um, emotional, mental health issues. And you've got to be so careful between telling them what needs to be written there in my opinion, I think you should do this and not killing the spirit so they think, oh, I'm crap, I'm useless, I can't do this, I'm never going to write again. And, you know, as a new writer, I've been there, every single negative word hurts. Now, somebody could say to me, that's the biggest load of rubbish I have ever read in my life, and I'd say, fine, your opinion. Well, you've had, also I've built had, that skin a little bit too. Absolutely. And that's what writers need and editors need to be aware of that and need to be sensitive and always try. And as you build a rapport with your clients, I try to use humour in my editing. I, I'll try to make a little funny to try and get things to stick in a, a, a writer's mind. And there's a very definite fine line between humor and sarcasm oh yes and don't cross and, it if you know that person if you don't know that person well yes, sarcasm I is learned sarcastic and i try so hard not to um you know it, it is it is a, it's a delicate balance yes and i will admit i like your snarky sarcastic comments for example Good. I think that, like, there was one time I think Ian asked Neftiri, like, is everything all right? And you just answered it with however you were feeling. And I'm like, well, <laughs> <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> so, because we've hit that point where I feel I can do that now. Yes. And you I know, will admit, and as a writer, I look for her editing passes back for the comments. It's all about fun. It, it, yes. it, it's a job. It's a job for you. It's a job for me. But if we can have a laugh and have a bit of fun while we're doing it, then all the better. And by using humour, things do stick in the writer's mind. Repetition yes. and humour. Very much so. So I think that's about it for us today, Saint Adam. Thank you for joining me, hon. You are very welcome. And I have really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for having me. And where can they find you at online then? Okay, so bestbookeditors.com. Um, Facebook. Let me just have a look and see what my linky thing says. I think it's best book editors is what I normally plug in for the at with it whenever I tag you. Yeah, it just best book editors. 
Facebook, we've got the Facebook page, um, we've got the website, and the website is not just for people wanting our services. On there, we've got book reviews, yes. we've got articles, we've got writing articles. Interviews um, we've by got, authors, yeah, we've done by your authors. All the book trailers to have a look at, our um, pre-made shop with ready-made covers that you can use for your own inspiration. You don't have to come on to buy anything. You can just have a browse. There's lots on the site that you can click in and out of. Um, hints on writing that can help your writing, lots of tips, and hopefully some interesting bits and pieces that you enjoy reading. So come along and have a look. Definitely need to do that, my lovely son Walker. So check her out online, and thank you everyone for sitting in with us today. And then the next one, we'll get out here in another week. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye, son Walkers. Thank you.